pleasure to be here today. Um, I think I'll carry on some of the themes from the first panelists and uh, maybe go in a new direction. Uh, I'm a sociologist at Kansas State, and uh, I'm going to present some early, I think, first pass uh, preliminary results from a survey of uh, producers, owners, operators, uh, in the High Plains Ogallala Aquifer region. Uh, and hopefully that'll give us some insight. Uh, so the issue is groundwater depletion, the issue is water quantity primarily, but hopefully it'll give us a little bit more insight into the human aspects of, of water management. So the overview looks like this, and I'm going to go through a lot of material, and I'm happy to take questions about it, but I'm going to try to tell you a story, a narrative, that is emerging from the, the data that, uh, that came out of this group, of, of this analysis. So I'll go through uh, the rationale quickly and some of the key findings uh, that are emerging. And uh, I want to emphasize that the talk is descriptive. It's not explanatory yet, uh, but it's to describe overall patterns. Uh, and we will break out, I'll break out uh, responses by state, sort of where, where meaningful, so we can start to see uh, some of the disaggregated results and make a little more sense of what's going on. And uh, I also view uh, uh, this group of producers as a group. Uh, I don't disaggregate by type of operation yet, uh, whether they're irrigated, irrigators, whether they're what percentage of irrigation versus dry land they have, and so on. Because I think we have a collective management problem, and we have to start thinking in terms of uh, groups and wholes, and how do we bring people together across lines that traditionally divide us to manage this uh, very important resource. So an alternative title today, along with a takeaway point, um, is that it could be a case for talking about what we value and why we value it, um, and, or why we need to have many more conversations about conservation, and why those conversations should focus on what we're conserving, not just how to conserve it. Uh, that's the key takeaway point. And so. Um, I'm going to put forward the idea that perhaps is worth pursuing and that we shift uh, at least some of the mindset for dealing with something like groundwater depletion from the emphasis on technical infrastructures, and that may not be a popular line here, uh, to social infrastructure, to networks, cultures, capacities for conservation, which in some cases in the, in the groundwork we're doing are, are stronger than others uh, in, in the region. So what's the motivation for the, for the work? Time is running out uh, uh, for the Ogallala, and it's already been a long time. Uh, we've known about depletion for over 40 years in this region, and time is running very short. And we need to know something more about how people view water, how and why they value it or not. Uh, where are the shared values? Where are the competing tensions? Uh, in people's overview, outlooks, attitudes toward water. And then knowing something more about that, we can try to help as social scientists and scientists to help build capacity uh, to solve problems, if this is a goal. And I emphasize if, because yes, uh, depletion of the aquifer has been framed as a problem for a very long time, but as a social scientist, the one thing I want to know before I go into the field and try to solve a problem is, do these people actually believe there's a problem? Uh, if, there's, if, if, it's, if it's not a legitimate problem in the eyes of the people that are confronting uh, the, the issue, then it's really hard to solve that problem with any form of technology we have. We're going to have very low uptake of that, of, that, of that technology. And in that sense, those conservation efforts would lack legitimacy in the eyes of the very people that we're asking to manage this resource on private property. So if the people that face the consequences of depletion don't believe there's a problem, uh, we have a hard time getting the technology rolled out uh, to where we need it. Motivation two is, of course, we know very little about attitudes and perceptions in this particular region. Uh, we have uh, work that's been done in the past, but it's off often about technology adoption, technology preferences. We know very little about people's attitudes and views towards conservation in general. And what we do know is f largely from limited scale and scope in time and space. We don't have a lot of generalizability in this region after reviewing the literature. The one study that 
uh, was done, uh, that we, the, the last and only big regional survey was in the mid-80s by David uh, uh, Crom and Stephen White, who were geographers at Kansas State. And they were funded by the Ford Foundation. And they, looked, they did a survey across 184 counties as part that were defined by a 1984 federal study. And I'm not going to get into all the details of this. I just introduced the idea to set up the study we're looking at. Uh, they, they, they focused on 14 counties in the region, highlighted there, uh, and they picked these counties for irrigated acres for key crops and water sources and so on. They identified these 14 counties and they surveyed them. 3,500 uh, folks were surveyed and they got about 1,000 responses back. And uh, uh, I'm not going to go into all their details. I'll do one comparison in a minute. Uh, but they focused... <clears throat> we focus on a broader set of questions and issues among a narrower constituency. So they were looking at the public and producers, and we're focused on producers, but we're focused on a broader range of questions for the producers in general. That's the takeaway there. So our data and methods, um, we define um, uh, the, the region in, as 227 counties in six states based upon hydrological data outlined there. And, uh, and we oversampled in those 14 counties of Crom and White so we could say something more representative about those four counties so we could draw some comparisons with those four counties. And uh, we sent out uh, 8,000 surveys and, and we had uh, about a 16% response rate, which about is, our is a, as good as a target you can have these days. I think the Ag Census, when it first went out, had one of the lowest response rates it's ever had this year is what I is what I what I heard. So it's getting difficult to survey. We were really we were generally pretty pretty pleased. We had 1,200 responses overall, and I'll be happy to talk with you about all the data and methods and the questions if you want. Um, this is our demographic pro profile of the respondents. We're looking at uh, the typical uh, respondents: a 64 year old male uh, with uh, a high school education uh, predominantly. Uh, and uh, an income in the 50 to 75 K range, somewhere in there. And politically leans more conservative, of course, which we think is strongly representative of the region. And uh, when we look at irrigation on operations, we've got an ideal split. We split about 50-50. Couldn't have worked out any better. Uh, about 52% of the sample did not irrigate at all in 2017, there's the question, and 48% did. So we've got a good, good variability there, and there's the means and so on for those uh, dry land operators and on and on. So have problems we can finally answer, and this is something I want to do for a long time. How have views of this problem changed over a generation, over 34 years since Crom and White did the study? So this is Crom and White. I'm going to show you a lot of pie charts now, and I'm just going to go through them quickly to try to tell you the story, but how serious is the problem? Uh, in 1984, Crom and White put that question to, the, to producers and public, that's the difference, and the mean was 3.74 on, on their scale, of, and they used a different scale, but 57% of their respondents said it was very serious in 1984. And 84% said we have a serious to very serious problem in 1984. And today, okay, now we have a different, I'm going to break this down in a couple different ways. Uh, the mean is absolutely unchanged in the 14 counties that they surveyed. We got the same mean, 3.74. It's still a serious problem. And it's absolutely, the idea. I, had to, I looked at it three different times, okay? It's absolutely the same number with a different constituency. Uh, the percentage viewing the problem as very serious has declined by 20 points, though. Now, they had the public included, which probably raised the uh, alarm, uh, uh, the perception of the severity of the problem. But we can go further. Okay, so here's the question we answered in our five categories. And like 34 years ago, a majority of producers see this as a, as a problem. And... Uh, 81% of the people out there responding to the survey said this is at least a somewhat serious problem. And about 60% are telling us it's serious or very serious. So we're very close to where we were in 1984. It's still seen as a severe problem. How does the perception of the problem vary by state? Nebraska stands out as very different. 
uh, as you might expect. Uh, Crom and White didn't seem to disaggregate their data by state, but 42% of the people in Nebraska responding said it's serious or very serious. But in the other five of the other six states, we have a super majority, two thirds, telling us it's serious or very serious by state. Two thirds in Colorado, 75% in Kansas. As you go further south, we're at 85% in New Mexico. So we have a legitimate problem in the eyes of uh, producers. But we can back up and we, we, don't, we can limit bias from framing the thing as a problem, and we do this in a different way. So I ask simply, we ask simply, should groundwater be conserved? Yes or no? Should, that's the question we asked. And 92% of the samples telling us yes. And by state, no fewer than eight in 10 are saying yes across the region, even in Nebraska. So as a robustness check, we ask this way. Groundwater should be used. Groundwater does no good in the ground. How strongly do you agree or disagree? And I, that question comes from a couple years of field work uh, where we are talking with lots of people in the field and this very line comes up again and again and again. What good does groundwater do in the ground? So we ask people, how representative is that opinion? Only about a quarter agree to some extent with that statement. Of note, a third are neutral on that question. And there's some difference across states here, right? So, but overall, about a quarter of people say groundwater does no good in the ground, but that doesn't seem to be the majority. In fact, that's a very small minority. By state, no more than a third agree with that. Just 14% in Kansas agree with that. So thus far, groundwater depletion, we can say, yes, it is a legitimate problem in the eyes of the producers, it's, and yes, it does seem to be worth saving or conserving. It's a serious or very serious problem and a clear majority uh, in every state except Nebraska. And there is some division in use or ethic value uh, here that whether we leave it in the ground or not, but there are pluralities in all the states against stronger use values in that sense. So we went and asked, how, well, how dependent are you on groundwater? And this is the question. How important is it for the profitability of your, product, your, your operation? And there are clear personal interests at stake about even, remember, we got dry land operators in here who don't irrigate at all, but 71% of the folks responding tell us it's clearly important. How about for the community? We asked for self and then we asked for the community. Groundwater is important because it provides jobs and business opportunities in my community. Even more alignment on the perception of community dependence, which is striking to us in a world where we're told that farmers are self-interested. We hear, we see the community side, that actually we see more alignment, more per, stronger perception that the community is dependent on this, even more than my, higher percentage there than my own operation, right? So we ask about vulnerability or exposure to the problem. Groundwater levels are a problem for my farm family or household. Strong split here, and that's because we've got dry land operators, full dry land all the way down to full or lots of irrigation. Um, so we've got different levels of vulnerability is what this, what this shows us. Um, and there are differences across state. Uh, we see much more prevalent or, of perceived exposure in Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, and Oklahoma, as we might expect, and the lowest uh, perceived vulnerability in Nebraska, as we might expect. So what about how people perceive the vulnerability of their communities to this problem? Uh, we have more agreement here. About half of the survey says groundwater levels uh, are a problem for my community. So much, again, clearer alignment on the community questions than the self-interest question. We break this down by state. Again, about half agree. Uh, but in all states, the perception of the community problem is greater than the perception of the personal problem, which was striking to us. Uh, in Kansas, the gap in perception is between personal and community is the largest. There's a 24% difference here. 61% of the respondents in Kansas are telling us it's a big problem for our community, and just 37% were telling us uh, that it was the self, it was a problem for their farmer operation. So if there's a problem, we ask about responsibility. Uh, how strongly do you feel personally responsible for depletion in your area? And the majority are telling us they don't feel responsible for it, which is interesting. So we have to unpack that a bit. 
Two-thirds are disagreeing or strongly disagreeing with that statement. Okay, so then we ask about, well, how, willingness, how willing are you to conserve? And more importantly, what's your capacity to conserve? So I think that's what's going on here. So we ask about willingness. I should conserve my or minimize my groundwater use. There's a big split there. 40% disagree or strongly disagree with the willingness to do it. But there's a large neutral group that's on the fence on that question, about 40%. Uh, they're, they're mixed. And I think we go further into the capacity question where we ask, I already limit my groundwater use as much as possible. We see some of the answer there start to unfold. There's strong agreement here that they have limited capacity to save it. They're telling us three quarters of people are saying, I already limit this use as much as possible, which is also striking. Uh, but maybe not surprising given how long we've had to tackle the problem. Okay, so what are the perceived barriers to change to, to con conservation? We listed a bunch here from less common answers to more common answers. The, the least common answers, mo we ask people, so regardless of what you think about saving, why, most people don't save more groundwater because we, we displace, we depersonalize it. They tell us most people don't say because, not because it takes too much effort to conserve it. Only 21% said that. It doesn't take too much effort. It's not because environmental regulations are too strict. It's not because they don't know what options exist to save it. Okay, we get in here to more common answers about why people don't serve. Water regulations are not strict enough. About half the sample tells us that. Uh, if they don't pump the water, someone else will. About half the sample tells us that's another good reason. They're self-interested or greedy. 53% of the people tell us that's a more common reason people don't do it. It would require more expensive technology, again, about half, a little over half the sample. Most common reasons, people simply don't want to change their irrigation practices, two-thirds, and three-fourths, it would decrease production. Maybe not surprising, but these are what people are telling us are the main barriers. So if it can be conserved, and we'll start to wrap up, why? Why conserve it? For whom or what should we save this? Which I think are the big questions. Groundwater should be conserved today so that it's available to producers if commodity prices are higher in the future. Well, about 40% of people tell us that's a good reason. A large neutral category there, 4 in 10. Groundwater should be conserved today so that it's available to producers if drought becomes more frequent. Three out of every four respondents say that's a very good reason to save it. But the strongest agreement we have are on what we call altruistic measures. So that jobs and business opportunities in my, are continue to be available in my community in the future, two thirds. Future generations in my area can enjoy the benefits I've experienced, almost nine in 10. And again, almost nine in 10 when we make it about their own kids and grandkids can enjoy the benefits I've experienced. That's why, if we're going to have save it, there are some good reasons to do it. There's the language, I think. So then we get down to the economics questions, which are much more common. So what's groundwater worth in dollars? And if we have economists among us, they're not going to like these questions, and it may get nasty during the Q&A. Okay, but <laughs> no, it will. It, but this is not an economically, econometrically sound question. But I, we asked it, and I had economists as part of this team uh, on the team, and they asked it in a very robust, rigorous way, according to the science that they think is sound. I asked it in a very straightforward way that I wanted to ask it. I just asked, in your farming operation, what's the current value of groundwater in dollars per acre feet? Now, a thousand people didn't answer the question. Of the respondents that turned back, they left that blank. That was by far the anomaly of all the questions. So we had 267 people respond, much smaller sample size. 500 didn't tell us uh, that because they don't irrigate, and they say, I can't value it. And 456 said no answer, and they didn't tell us why. I think that's telling about the economics of the problem. I don't think people know what the value of the water is because it's free, effectively. That's speculation. The maximum somebody told us it's worth today is $900 an acre foot. And the minimum is zero. Somebody said it's worth nothing. 33% uh, of, so of respondents that did tell us the value said it's worth zero. It's just worth nothing. 
And the median answer is $99 an acre foot today, and the mean is two, about 240. But that's skewed because of all the, uh, all the zeros. So we look at the median. By state, we break it out, and we can see that in Kansas, the median is the highest value, uh, the highest median values in Kansas, about $125 an acre foot. Texas, Colorado, Oklahoma tells us zero. Yeah, not worth anything today. Nebraska is telling us it's $50 an acre foot. Now, these are people that responded, right? Uh, 267. It's a small sample size, but it gives us some figures, I think, to work with. So then I ask, well, what do you think it's worth in the future, 50 years from now? If it's not worth anything today in Oklahoma, what's it worth 50 years from now? What's, why say this? Think ahead 50 years. Assuming you have the same quantity in 50 years, we had to ask that for controlling. But what do you think the value of groundwater will be in dollars per acre foot for your farming operation? And again, a thousand people didn't answer. Um, about the same numbers. The median is $125, about a 25% increase over today, is what they're telling us in 50 years. But there's a lot, it hides a lot of variation. Uh, uh, the mean goes up to 327. There's a lot of variation across state. Colorado's telling us there's going to be a 600% increase in the value of groundwater between now and 50 years. Kansas is telling us it'll almost, it'll more than double, 160%. New Mexico, 430% increase. Texas, 36%. Nebraska sees it, will think it, thinks it will double. And in Oklahoma, they still think it's worth nothing in Oklahoma. But there's only nine, okay? So we got to be very careful with sample size. It's just, and, and that'll get conversation started. Well, what's the statistical significance? What's the power here? And so on and so forth. And I, I acknowledge all of that. But I think it's time we talk about what it's worth, finally, in just plain language. And we ask this of all kinds of people when we do interviews. We just say, what's it worth? Now we finally can have something to get us some traction on what a representative sample thinks it's worth. So how do we feel today better than compared to five years ago and where are we going? We asked them that question to finish things off. And the producers tell us 40% were a little bit better uh, than we were before. But what we see from this question is stability, basically. Farmers, producers are saying we're be no better or worse off in five years or so. And that struck us too, given all the talk about crisis. Uh, that struck us too. So, so what do we take away from this? Uh, there's five, six points. One, Nebraska, where we are, is different. We see that clearly. Uh, when we talk about the Ogallala, Nebraska is different. Two, yes, there is a legitimate problem, and it's perceived to be about as severe as it was in 36 years, 34 years ago. Okay. Many, three, do not know how to or want to place a dollar value on water. And I, if I could show you the file with the colorful comments, because we allowed open comment at the end. This was the one that got the colorful comments. Okay. Uh, those responding tell us it's not very, worth much today, but it's perceived to be much more valuable in the future. Drought, if there's a personal reason to do it, it's to save for drought. Uh, considerable perceived dependence on, uh, with lots of variation in personal vulnerability, but drought's a good personal reason to save it for your operation. But... A key aspect of the challenge that comes out of this seems to be social. Um, so pushing tech adoption further, irrigation efficiency and so on, can still and should still play a role. But many tell us they're doing what they can. Three and four are telling us this is what we can do. Now, whether that has veracity or not is worth exploring, but that's what they're telling us. Um, there, if we're going to push that, it, it should be more about extending or broadening the uptake of those, of those technologies. That sh should be done. But we should expect more limited returns to those, to those, uh, those efforts. Because, but uh, it, it, though pushing that effort could be a means of building networks, creating capacities, conversations, cultures about conservation. And we see that work going on in a lot of areas. Six, despite variation in personal exposure or vulnerability to the problem, of which there's a lot of variation in the region, the perception of the community dependence on this resource is stronger and much less variable, which struck us. It's likely if we would have included the public like Crom and White, we're talking 80 to 90% of respondents telling us that we're in a big world of hurt. Remember, we're only looking at producers here, a subset of the real community out there. And finally, if that's the case, 
then there seems to be some good news that farmers aren't all just self-interested, greedy, rational actors, that there's sufficient altruism in this group. There are strong majorities that tell us that there's a future for others in this region, and that's the most important reason to conserve for jobs and businesses, for future generations, and for my kids and grandkids. And I think that's why uh, we should, uh, I should have titled the talk probably a case for talking about what we value and why we value water. And it's push, the push is to have more conversations with more people, but not just conversations about conservation, but about what we're actually conserving when we conserve water. We're conserving the future of this, these particular places, and it goes well beyond the farm gate. And so it may be an idea worth pursuing that we use the, the push for technical infrastructures to expand the social infrastructure, the networks, the cultures, and the capacities for conservation. And I think we can do that by talking about a shared language on what it is we're actually conserving. So I want to acknowledge the USDA NEFA who funded uh, this effort and the Ogallala Water CAP Coordinated Ag Project and Kansas State University who supported, supported this work and I thank you for your attention. Thanks.